Sports program is brought to you in living color. Hi, I'm Joe Garagiola in New York. And I'm Sandy Koufax in Pittsburgh. And it's our pleasure to welcome you to the very first night game in World Series history. <laughs> World Series Report 71 with Joe Garagiola and Sandy Koufax. Brought to you by Texaco and the many thousands of Texaco retailers and distributors in all 50 states. Trust Texaco to have the right gasoline Good for evening. you. What an evening this figures to be. Since 1935, when the very first Major League night game was played in Cincinnati, night baseball has become an important part of the baseball scene. Since 1903, the World Series has been America's number one sports event. And tonight, for the very first time, the two come together. And in the next half hour, Sandy and I invite you to join us for some looks at yesterday's third game of this year's World Series. We're going to visit with some of the men who have helped the Pittsburgh Pirates and the Baltimore Orioles get into this year's World Series. And then a special trip into the world of the umpires, including a chance to see what kind of an umpire you would make. And then we're going to have a special visit from two old friends, Bob and Ray. You know, some players prefer to play night games, while others like Ernie Banks of the Chicago Cubs, well, he says things like, the time to play this game is during the day. And sometimes I think that's the real reason the Lord invented sunshine. Well, now, to me, it really didn't make too much difference. You see, the evenings were just a little bit cooler, and that changed my game plan a little bit because I had to take a jacket to the bullpen. And I'm just wondering, about Sandy Koufax, but first I do want to ask Sandy, Sandy, do we need a jacket tonight because of the weather? Joe, it's been a very pleasant day, and they say it's going to be a pleasant evening temperature-wise. Uh, forecast, 55, 60 degrees. The only problem is they're also forecasting a 30 to 40 percent chance of rain, and uh, that could cause a problem. We're hoping that it'll be later tonight before the rain shows up here in Pittsburgh. Sandy, what about a night game? Uh, what, did you rather pitch a night or during the day? Well, I think uh, as you started to talk about it, uh, I think the weather played a big factor in that. Uh, being a pitcher, you get to July and August in the east, it's very hot and humid sometimes. You prefer the evening because it was easier to keep your stuff. A lot of hitters, I think, prefer to play during the day. Maybe for that reason, maybe they see the ball better. How about the catcher's signals? After all, you know, the catcher's got to lead you pitchers through it, and you have to see the signals. Did you see him at night? Did you have any problems? Well, sometimes on the road you could have a little bit of a problem because of the gray uniform it being a little tougher to see from the mound. But I've known that there are some pitchers who've had problems seeing the catcher's signs all the time. Hey, I discussed that, Sandy, with an old teammate of yours, Joe Pignatano, a catcher with you, and now he's the coach with the New York Mets, just wondering... Did you have any problems with pitchers who didn't see the ball or see your finger signs? Yes, Joe, uh, I did, uh, especially in the Coliseum. The Coliseum was bad. The lighting was real bad. And uh, Drysdale, he used, to give me his, he used to give me what he was going to throw. I never called him. He called him. And he'd walk up to the rubber. We'll use this as the rubber. And he'd, and he'd go like this. That was his fastball. And if he was knocking dirt from his cleats, that was his curveball. And he threw his changeup off his fastball. Did he move you at all behind the plate? He, he couldn't shake you off because he was calling the pitches. Right, yeah, Joe. He did. Uh, he shook his head, but only because I was sitting inside and he wanted the ball outside or vice versa. But that's the only time he shook his head. Man, I wish some of my pitchers had done that. I mean, call their own game. That would have saved me a lot of embarrassing moments because managers would always start with the same line. Hey, dummy, how could you call for a fastball in a spot like that? You know... As I watched the third game of the World Series yesterday, I couldn't help thinking about the different styles of the players that I was watching. It made me wonder if baseball is what singers have in mind when they sing about the games people play. Roberto Clemente. They say this is the worst looking, best hitter in baseball. Look at him screw himself into the ground. Need a pair of pliers to get him out of there. A good bad ball hitter. Strike zone is any ball he can reach. Here's Manny saying, Gian, I like his style of just reaching for the ball. Forget the body, there's the bat on the ball. Nice little polite single. May have done it the artificial turf. Just reaches. They say you should get your body into it. 
Watch this fellow, Frank Robinson. This is a hitting clinic. Perfect swing. Every ounce into the swing. Look at the follow through. Perfect. This is Bob Robertson. Watch the top half of his body, all strength. When he goes into it, look at those arms. Belong in a baking soda box. Power. On this base hit, I'm going to show you a classic slide. Hook slide away from the infielder. Brooks Robinson, though, this is not classic. Almost historical, that was an air. Of course, that was a classic head first slide. With a little half gainer by Oliver. Here it is in slow motion. It'll give you heartburn the hard way. At third base, going back, watch the helmet come off, and this is when he gets a kneecap sandwich. This is where it has to hurt. Robinson's knee hit Oliver, put a Windsor knot right on his nose. Classic pitcher yesterday, Steve Blass. Fastball in the outside corner, strike one. The thing to watch here is where he puts the ball. Outside corner. If he could pitch there all the time, low and outside, he'd go to the Hall of Fame on a one-way ticket. This next pitch is a fastball. Couldn't hit this with four bats. Perfect pitch. That'll make a broadcaster out of you quicker than any pitch I know. Hitting is timing, and pitching is upsetting the timing. Now that was a slow curveball. Watch it in slow motion. Way out in front. Big boot pile. And there is Steve Blass. He's congratulating everybody in sight. He's heading for the clubhouse, and he's heading for an interview, which is not too unusual when you win a World Series ball game. But for an unusual interview, I'll tell you something. You just stay right where you are. Coverage of the World Series by all parts of the media is tremendous, and that's why we feel very lucky to have with us one of America's top reporters and a very special guest. In keeping with a big event like the first World Series night game, we've arranged to have with us Bob and Ray's ace reporter, Wally Ballou. He's standing by with an in-depth interview with one of baseball's fading stars. Lee Ballou with my pregame guest, the grizzled veteran with some 20-odd years of baseball this season. And I speak, of course, of Stuffy Hodgson. Stuffy, how do you feel? Well, I feel uh, pretty sad, naturally, after all these years, to realize that this is the last campaign. Pretty sad. I think that's a pretty uh, normal reaction to have after a career like yours, a normal way to feel. But uh, still at all, you got to admit the game has been pretty good to you. Well, not as good to me as some of these young punks that are coming along. Well, now, I sense a note of rancor in that, uh, Stuffy. What do you mean, exactly? Well, uh... When I first came up here, playing the game was everything. Sure, you get paid for it, but uh, the kids now, all they care about is the big bonus and the big salary and the big cars and the big homes, beautiful women, vintage wines, making TV commercials and movies, and uh, sleeping late in the morning. Looks like uh, guys like you went wrong somewhere along the line, doesn't it? Well, like I say, this game passed me by somewhere. Now, uh, these kids, they all have these uh, little radios going in the locker room all day, playing a bunch of noise. Now, I don't understand that kind of music. Whatever happened to the songs that uh, Kate Smith and Pat Boone sang? I mean, those guys sang real songs. Well, I don't know much about uh, music, Stuffy, but I do know one thing, that uh, you managed to keep your sense of humor. You have to. I think that's uh, very important. As a matter of fact, that sense of humor has made you a big uh, demand speaker on the banquet circuit. Could you tell us one of those stories? Well, I'd like to, uh, Wally, sure. I always remember the first time I came up to bat in the big leagues. I was just a kid, of course, and uh, I was nervous. And uh, they had a big left-hander out on the mound that day. Do you remember him? Yeah, I remember him well. Well, he was, uh, he was throwing real smoke that day. I couldn't see those pitches go by me. And uh, the umpire back of the plate. Do you remember him? A great big guy. Big guy, yeah. Well, he said, strike three, you're out. So, so uh, like I say, I was a kid, nervous and everything. I took my bat and I threw it straight up in the air. Well, the umpire took off his mask and he comes over to me and he says, a young man, 
I was a young man then. He says, uh, young man, if that bat comes down, you're out of the game. <laughs> the kids don't have jokes and anecdotes like that anymore. No, I guess, uh, I guess they don't. Tell me this. Uh, I know over the years you've come to be known as a guy who didn't take uh, too much care of his diet, <clears throat> didn't look out for what he ate or drank or how much, and still at all, you look to be in pretty good shape. Uh, how do you account for that? Well, looks can be deceiving, uh, Wally. Uh, actually, I haven't felt good for a couple of years. Oh, is that so? What do you mean? Well, I'm uh, suffering from uh, chronic garagiola. Well, what is that exactly? Well, uh, in addition to a low back pain, it's the persistent inability to hit a pitched ball with a bat. I see. Now, over these past uh, 20 years, Stuffy, you must have seen a lot of changes take place in the game. Could you tell us about one that seems to stand out? Well, uh, this uh, artificial turf, you know, you have uh, turned the game around. You have the, your infielders back there to make a play. The ball takes these crazy hops and jumps up and hits them here on a clavicle or something. No, no, you've got to have ground to play this game on. Dig in and make a play. Well, listen, you better dig in and make a play. If you don't dig in and make a play, you're not going to win this game. And that goes for both teams, regardless. I guess so. Do you think now they're going to retire your number? No, they got some young punk wearing it over here now. Yeah. <laughs> I've just been given a speed-up signal. I want to ask you one more question. It must be a real thrill to be here at this historic first night World Series game. Yes, it is a real thrill. But it's just another ball game. He said that like a real ball player. Just another ball game. Bob and Ray got hit on a clavicle. I know what a clavicle is. It's right there. Hey, for the men you'll see playing tonight, though, in tonight's ball game, their training ground went from the sandlots to the minor leagues. But there'll also be some men on the field who went through a different kind of training. Watch this. What are those guys doing, you figure? Oh, that's nice, guys. Foul ball. Okay. That's what they like to call. You know, once they've learned the three R's of uh, umpire, and I think there are three R's. We used to have reading, writing, arithmetic. They got uh, rule books, right decision, and running catchers out of the game. Sometimes they need help. Isn't that easy? Now, Lou DeMuro, his eyes were all right. His ears might have been deceiving. He thought the ball hit the bat. Frank Robinson said it hit his leg. The camera shows you where it hit. But Lou DeMuro didn't have that camera. Listen to this. Possible he ever tagged you. You're no right. way. Get, get out you of here. Get out of there. You were right here and he knocked you over and went around. There's no way possible, Kenny. You never, there's no way you can even see the Kenny, I said he tagged him. How could you see if he tagged him, Kenny, when you were knocked down? Huh? Tell you. Kenny, you were knocked down. How can you call him out? I said he tagged him. From last year's World Series, diction and grammar was perfect. Now watch this. What motivates an umpire? This is a peaceful sight. And then look out. Now watch the umpire. He's going to be the peacemaker. But he's smart enough never to take off his mask. And then self-preservation. Sometimes an umpire doesn't make a decision. Watch him try to sneak in there. Now. Oops, got in the back door through the servant's entrance. Hey, now, have you ever sat in a ballpark and you boot an umpire's decision? What's coming up is especially for you, even if you haven't booed anybody. Let's find out right now what kind of an umpire you'd make. Remember now, you're the umpire, and we want a decision, and we want it right now. The umpire has to make his decision right away. Watch. What is he? Uh-huh. 
Uh-huh, you called it too soon. Okay, here's another one. Safer out. Gotta wait. Watch this. What'd you call it? He was safe. Well, how'd you do? You have a better appreciation now of the umpire's job? But to be completely honest, we kind of picked those plays. Not every call is that tough. Sometimes you get all set for a real close call, one of those bang-bangs, and it turns out to be an easy one. Watch this one. <laughs> that umpire was very Italian, wasn't he? Hey, in just a minute, it'll be time to talk to some of the people most directly concerned in this year's World Series. The guys who are looking for a winner's share. Well, right here, it's time to talk to the man who hit the big home run for the Pittsburgh Pirates yesterday, Bob Robertson, and a couple of fellows who know what it's like to be the winning pitcher in the World Series, Pittsburgh's Steve Blass and our own Sandy Koufax. Thank you, Joe. And since it seems that most people would like to see the long ball in baseball, let's talk to the man who hit the home run. Bobby, first of all, you hit that on a, on a bunt play. You're supposed to be sacrificing. There's very little chance of your being fined by Danny Murtaugh, is there? No, uh, there wasn't any indication that I was going to be fined yesterday. Danny didn't say anything after the game about it. He just smiled a little bit. But in a very important series like this, whenever you make a mental mistake like I did, uh, I think you should be fine. But uh, the way things have turned out, I think it was for the best. Uh, I don't think anybody would argue, uh, most of all, Steve Blass. What about this ballpark? This is the first night game in World Series history. A lot of hitters have said that they have trouble seeing the ball at night. They only see the top half of the ball. What are the lighting conditions in this new Pittsburgh park? We have wonderful lighting here. I don't think it's going to make any difference whether uh, playing at night here. Uh, I don't think it's going to make any difference to the pitchers or to the hitters, especially uh, uh, in this ballpark. we got good lights, and uh, uh, the rest of the stadiums in the league, uh, some of them aren't as good as we have here. Uh, so I don't expect any trouble as far as seeing the ball at home plate. What about the pitcher for the Orioles tonight, Pat Dobson? I think you faced him when he was at San Diego. Uh, did you hit him well? What do you expect? I guess your whole ball club probably knows him. Dobson, uh, well, he has the same type of stuff that uh, Palmer has for Baltimore. Uh, he doesn't throw as hard, but he's got the same type of breaking pitch. Uh, he has come up with a palm ball, an off-speed pitch, which he uses a, a great deal. So uh, I'm looking forward to a a real good battle tonight between the pitchers and the hitters. What about hitting in this ballpark at night? Does the ball carry not quite as well here in the evening as it does during the day? I don't think the ball is going to carry as good tonight as it did uh, yesterday in the ball game. But uh, if uh, I get a hold of one or any other hitters get a hold of one, if you hit it good enough, it's going to go out. It doesn't make any difference about the win. Well, I know you're strong enough to hit it out of anywhere. And thank you very much and good luck to you. And I'm going to talk to your partner over here, Steve Blass, for a while. Steve? First of all, congratulations on yesterday's game. It's, uh, I think, one of the finest I've seen in the series, one of the finest I've seen all year. It looked like you had great stuff and great control all through the game. Yeah, it was a good ball game, and thank you very much. Uh, I'll pay Robertson's fine. Any fine he gets, I'll take care of the, uh, the tab on it. Uh, I felt better as the ball game went along because uh, I wound up having three pitches to work on, and, and uh, usually during a ball game, you'll wind up discarding a pitch along the way or, or going to another pitch, but... All three of them uh, were really working well for me, so I stayed with them, and I think this helped me stay strong. I, d I just didn't have to try to throw the fastball by him all the time. What about the scouting report on Baltimore? I know sometimes a team gets a scouting report, and a pitcher looks at it and has to make a change in what he's going to do or how he's going to try and pitch. Well, we got a, a very uh, thorough scouting report, and I, I would say, like all scouting reports, it was pretty accurate, but... Uh, you also can't get away from your own style of pitching. So I stayed mainly with the way I know I can pitch. Uh, uh, I made a couple of notes on a couple of the things that I saw during the first two games, but seeing a ball club for two games doesn't really tell you a lot because uh, 
Saturday they hit the long ball, and then the in the second game they just hit a lot of singles. So uh, I was kind of caught in the middle. I didn't know whether they'd be swinging for the long ball or trying to just uh, hit the ball straight away and get on base. So I uh, I just uh, tried to go with the way I have to pitch. Could you give me just a little quick rundown on Luke Walker, tonight's pitcher? Yes, I can. Uh, of all the pitchers on our staff, Luke by far has the best stuff, the best natural ability. He's got a fastball that... Uh, he doesn't turn over to be a sinker or he doesn't cut it so much, but his fastball is really live and it's liable to go either direction, which makes it really tough. And he's got a very explosive curveball, uh, I think uh, similar to the one you used to throw. Uh, and he's he's overpowering when he's right. Uh, he just overpowers a ball club. Well, that's great. Thank you, Steve. Good luck to you. We're looking forward to seeing you possibly Saturday in Baltimore. Now let's go back to Joe in New York. Okay, Sandy, that big Robertson talking about missing the bunt, that's become the great play of baseball. He's missed the bunt a couple times and then pop one right out of the ballpark. Those big sluggers never get the bunt sign. That's the problem. When they do get the bunt sign, shock sets in because the bunt sign is the easiest uh, sign in, in the world. At Pittsburgh, for example, this was our bunt sign. We had a letter on our cap when you covered it with the right hand. We're playing the Dodgers one day. First and second, nobody out. Seventh place hitter is up, right? Everybody knows he should bunt. Our coach goes to here and goes through all this, which means absolutely nothing, and our guy backs out of the box and gives it this. No, I ain't got it. I ain't got it. So all of a sudden, our coach very deliberately goes through it again, gets to here, goes down slowly. Our guy's going, I ain't got it. I ain't got it. I ain't got it. Finally, the coach is standing just like this, whistles, goes like that, and our guy's going, I ain't got it. Preacher Rowe, pitcher for Brooklyn, says, want you to bunt. B-U-N-T. Not that tough a play. You know what's tough? is getting a bunt sign so the pitcher can knock the guy in. That's tough. Sandy, we've been having some fun trying to pick the star of the game before it's even played. Uh, you did a great job yesterday. Congratulations, you picked Steve Blass. So uh, what does your crystal ball say tonight, left-hander? Well, thank you, Joe. I think tonight I'm going to have to go with Paul Blair. Uh, with the left-hander Luke Walker pitching, uh, Blair should be in center field tonight. He was last year's leading hitter in the series. He hasn't appeared in it yet, so... Uh, I think Paul is due for a good night. There may be another change up, a change in the Baltimore lineup. I'm not sure whether Boog Powell or Don Buford will be playing for Baltimore this evening. So you have Blair, and I'll tell you, I'm going to a little upset on you. I've been watching the Baltimore catchers. I like the way they're handling their pitchers. I'm going to pick Dobson because the catchers will lead them through. All right. Uh, figures that an old catcher would lay it all on the catchers. If Dobson <laughs> does it, it's probably going to be to his credit. Well, there you see, the ticket for game number four, the World Series. And I don't care who the ball player is, that's for him the biggest thrill. I know for me, 1946, to play in the World Series. But only nine guys can play on each side. During the World Series, Sandy Koufax and I have had some fun trying to pick the star of the game. We've each made some good picks, we've made some bad picks. But there's one problem with that. We're pretty much limited to the players in the starting lineups, only nine guys on both sides. And we're overlooking a lot of the guys. Each of these guys contributed to his team being there, yet some of them may not get to play a single inning in the World Series. And I guarantee you that every team that ever played in the World Series included guys that a spotlight never got around to. So Sandy and I didn't want to let this World Series pass by without giving a salute to some of the guys who not, well, they didn't make the headlines, but I'll guarantee you they made contributions to getting the headliners into that World Series. So we salute you guys. And, of course, I'm getting set to watch the ball game, and I want to ask Wally Ballou and Stuffy, who are you picking, Wally? Well, I think I'm going to pick Baltimore, uh, Joe. How about old stuff? Well, I, you know, I think I'll go with Pittsburgh because they're playing here in the friendly confines of Forbes Field. <laughs> well, let's just sit back and watch just another ball game. Series Report 71 has been brought to you by Texaco and the many thousands of Texaco retailers and distributors in all 50 states. Trust Texaco to have the right gasoline for you. And now stay tuned following station identification for game number four of the 1971 World Series.
A beautiful actress. You guys televising tonight? Hey, Harry. You guys televising tonight? Oh, jeez. Look what I did. What? Oh, you're going to kill me. Hurry up, hurry up. Fix him up. Oh, God. Don't worry about it. I apologize. Don't worry about it. This is the Golden Triangle of Pittsburgh, and there's a light on tonight, the fourth time in the history of the city of Pittsburgh, as all the office buildings have their lights on, to celebrate the first night game in the history of the World Series. Here on the banks of the Monongahela, the Alleghenies, they join to form the Ohio River, and you're moving now into one of the most beautiful new parks in baseball, Three River Stadium. Yes, sir. Welcome to Three River Stadium as NBC Sports, a service of NBC News, presents Game 4 of the 1971 World Series. The American League champions, the Baltimore Orioles, versus the National League champions, the Pittsburgh Pirates. Brought to you by Chrysler Corporation, Extra Care and Engineering, your host tonight, your local Dodge dealer. By the two-bladed razor, the new Gillette Track 2 Twin Blade Cartridge Shaving System. And by Phillips 66, the performance company. At Phillips 66, it's performance that counts. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I'm Kurt Gowdy of NBC Sports. This is Bob Prince, the broadcaster of the Pittsburgh Pirates. And my NBC Game of the Week partner, Tony Kubek, will be roaming the stands tonight with his comments. And for our first night game, we have a beautiful night. 72 degrees here. It's warm enough to... Well, you don't need a, a sweater or top coat tonight. Not much wind. And you know, it seemed odd today to be standing around a hotel lobby in the afternoon waiting for the World Series at night. We've had 397 World Series games played before this one, all in the daytime. And here we are. And we're glad you could be with us, all of us at NBC, and you fans not only across America, but around the world for this historic event. Now... Let's move over here to Bob Prince of the Pirates as they won yesterday to get back into the series. Bob, you've been with the Pirates a long time. You are in their clubhouse after the game yesterday and today. What's the feeling of the Pirate team now? Well, Kurt, after two crushing defeats at the hands of the Baltimore Orioles, and of course they were really crushed in game two, they felt they turned the momentum of the Baltimore club around a little bit and gained some of their own. They picked up a lot of confidence, and the result is that they're raring to go in this game tonight. And of course the Orioles, well, they seem to win graciously and they lose graciously not much to say they had a 16 game winning streak snap and in this ballpark you're going to see here tonight the largest crowd in the history of Pittsburgh baseball yes yeah, standing room only only a thousand seats went on sale at six o'clock and they were gobbled up real quick the Pirates have played well at home they led the National League in home victories with the artificial turf how about the lighting here Bob that might be a bit of a problem to the center fielder, particularly for Baltimore. They're not used to it. It's a different angle on the lights, and it could cause him some trouble on balls that are lined right directly at the center fielder. And we've had a couple of changes. Right-hander Paul Blair goes to the outfield to start in place of Buford tonight for Baltimore. A right-handed hitting catcher, Echebarron, will be behind the plate. Danny Murtaugh has Hebner and Oliver left-handed batters in his lineup to try and get as many lefties as possible. Let's take a look now at the starting pitchers for tonight's game. And right now you're looking at the Baltimore right-hander, Pat Dobson. He was acquired in an off-season trade last winter from San Diego to strengthen the Baltimore depth. And strengthen them he did as he became a 20-game winner. Baltimore became the second team in the history of Major League Baseball to come up with four 20-game winners. Pat Dobson for Baltimore. From New Boston, Texas, James Luke Walker. Luke Walker won 10 games and lost eight. He has not pitched since September 22nd. Dobson has not started a game since September 24th. The two of them might be question marks tonight. 
Yes, that's very possible. One thing, uh, Chris, uh, I would say this, Kurt, they don't like to try to catch this fellow because he moves the ball all over the plate. If he can get it over, he's very tough to uh, whip, and you might see some pop-ups and ground balls tonight. And now let's go down to Tony Kubek. The first night game in World Series history, one of the men responsible, the commissioner of baseball, Bowie Q, and Mr. Commissioner, one of the most exciting highlights in baseball history today. It is a historic first, really, Tony. I'm excited about it. I'm excited about it because I think it's going to produce, my prediction is it will produce the greatest television audience for a sports event in the history of sports. I look for over 60 million Americans to be Ooh. tuned in. I think they're out there now. And uh, we have uh, over a thousand people from the various sports media here covering like that in the history of sports. It's an enormous event. What about plans or future plans for World Series play? Well, we're so satisfied that this single night game is the right thing to do, that next year we're going to have the three weekday games on at night so that you'll have Saturday and Sunday day, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday night. And that way the fans of America, the people who work, the kids in school can see the whole thing if they want to. Mr. Commissioner, a packed house here tonight. What about, of course, this ball game tonight? And I'm going to ask you for a prediction. Well, I don't make predictions in the World Series or almost any other time, but the Pirates in seven. Well, I just feel that the uh, Baltimore Orioles team is going to have to start scoring some runs because Pirates look like they're going to start hitting the ball around. Well, the Pirates can hit, and Baltimore has got tremendous pitching. As commissioner, I usually take the position I'll be happy to see seven games and settle for whoever wins in those seven. Boy, Kuhn, Mr. Commissioner, thank you so much. Thank you, Tony. Let's go back upstairs. All right, we're going to have the starting lineups announced to you very shortly. We have been entertained here before the game by the Pittsburgh Welcome University Band, University and Stadium now let's meet for the both teams. Game of the 1971 World Series. Here are the official lineups, and let's have a big Pittsburgh welcome as they're introduced. First, the American League champions, the Baltimore Orioles. Here is the manager of the Orioles, number four, Earl Weaver. Batting first and playing center field, number six, Paul Blair. Batting second. Batting second and playing shortstop, number seven, Mark Belanger. Batting third and playing left field, number 14, Merv Ruttenman. Batting fourth and playing right field, number 20, Frank Robinson. Batting fifth and playing third base, number five, Brooks Robinson. Batting sixth and playing first base, number 26, Boo Powell. Batting seventh and playing second base, number 15, Dave Johnson. Batting eighth and catching, number eight, Andy Etchebaron. Batting ninth and pitching, number 37, Pat Dobson, who is warming up in the bullpen. And here are the remaining players and coaches of the Baltimore Orioles. Don Buford, Mike Cuellar, Clay Dalrymple, Jerry DeVenon, Tom Dukes, Dick Hall, Elrod Hendricks, Grant Jackson, Dave Leonard, Kurt Moten, Dave McNally, Jim Palmer, Pete Rickert, Chico Simone, Tom Chopay, Eddie Watt, and coaches Jim Fry, Billy Hunter, and George Stoller. Now for the National League champions, the Pittsburgh Pirates. Here's the manager of the Pirates.
Batting first and playing second base, number 30, Dave Cash. Batting second and playing third base, number 20, Richie Hefner. Batting third, playing right field, number 21, Roberto Clemente. Batting fourth, playing left field, number eight, Willie Stargell. Batting fifth and playing center field, number 16, Al Oliver. Batting sixth and playing first base, number seven, Bob Robertson. Batting seventh and catching, number 35, Manny Sanguian. Batting eighth and playing shortstop, number two, Jack Hernandez. Batting ninth and pitching, number 23, Luke Walker, who is warming up in the bullpen. And here are the remaining players and coaches of the Pittsburgh Pirates. Gene Alley, Steve Blass, Nelson Bryles, Gene Clines, Vic Davalio, Doc Ellis, Dave Justy, Bob Johnson, Bruce Keeson, Milt May, Bill Mazeroski, Bob Miller, Bob Moose, Jose Pagan, Charlie Sands, and Bob Veal, and coaches Don Leppard, Frank Osiak, Don Osborne, Dave Ricketts, and Bill Verdon. Ladies and gentlemen, please rise for our national anthem, which will be sung by Mildred Miller, Metropolitan Opera Star. the meeting at home plate and Earl Weaver is back on the scene. He let the uh, Baltimore coach George Stoller take the lineup out one day after the Orioles had been in a losing streak. The Orioles won 16 in a row. So Weaver let his coach go out every day but they lost yesterday so Weaver number four now is back out with a lineup guard. And now the ceremonial first pitch of game four and the honor goes to one of the all time greats of the National League Stan Musial a Hall of Famer, seven-time National League batting champ, 3,630 hits in his career and a lifetime batting average of 331. That's his wife alongside Lillian Musial. And on Stan's left, Bing Crosby, one of the owners of the Pirates, along with Mr. John Galbraith, the uh, principal owner. And of course, right here from Pennsylvania, Stan Musial is from Denora, Pennsylvania, where he was born and reared. There's Bing. So the fourth game of the 1971 World Series being brought to you from Pittsburgh as the Baltimore Orioles meet the Pittsburgh Pirates.
<laughs> okay, I'll turn it over to Bob and let him do it. I'll do the umpire, turn it over to Bob for the defense. Six umpires assigned to World Series games. Tonight behind the plate, Ed Bargo, who lives in Butler, Pennsylvania, by the way, about 30 miles from Pittsburgh. Jim Odom working at first base. John Kibler at second base. Nestor Shylock at third base. Umpiring the left field line will be Ed Sudall, and the right field line will be handled by John Rice, who was born in Homestead, Pennsylvania, suburb of Pittsburgh. There go the Pirates on the field. We'll take a look at the electronic scoreboard here and set them up defensively for you. Stargell's in left field for Pittsburgh. Oliver's in center field. Flamini right field. Third base is Hebner. Shortstop will be Hernandez. The second baseman is Cash. The first baseman is Robertson. Sanguian is the Pittsburgh catcher. And Luke Walker will be starting tonight for the Pirates. That's Luke Walker warming up. And to tell you about Luke and take you along with the detailed play-by-play -play action of the first half of this game, the very popular and competent broadcaster of the Pittsburgh Pirates, Mr. Bob Prince. Thank you very much, Kurt Gowdy, and hello again, everybody. Now you see Luke Walker warming up here and in slow motion. He's right over the top, as you can see. And one of the very rare things about him he cannot throw a ball straight. There isn't anybody on the Pirate Ball Club that likes to warm him up, including the catcher. He does not know where that ball is going to go. It can run in and away from any type of batting. And normally when he's right, you'll see a lot of pop-ups, strikeouts, and certainly an awful lot of ground balls. Now, as pointed out a little earlier, he has pitched 12 no-hitters in high school, and he attended uh, Paris Junior College in Paris, Texas, and Texarkana Junior College. This is his ninth pro season. Began with the Boston Red Sox organization. And on the year for 1971, he won 10, and he lost eight. His last game he pitched on September the 22nd. He worked six innings against the Cardinals, and he helped clinch the division championship. Bob, it'll be interesting to see if the Orioles will be taking against him. He has a history of control problems. Yes, he definitely has that. Now, here's one of manager Earl Weaver's. Thank you. And enjoy the viewing. Paul Blair, Earl Weaver having made a bit of a switch, moving Blair, a fine outfielder, into center field. And the strike is there. They will now stop this game and give this ball to the commissioner of baseball, Bowie Kuhn. And that later will be then enshrined in the Hall of Fame. The commissioner of baseball now receiving that uh, baseball, and that'll be enshrined in the Hall of Fame where Ken Smith uh, presides. In Cooperstown, New York, the first pitch on the first night game of the World Series brought to you on NBC. 0-1 to Blair. Ran away from him a ball. Blair has one hit in the World Series. Went in defensively the other day, picked up a base hit. I'll tell you, Kirk, when Walker has it gone, he has a snake coming in at that plate. That's what the ball players say. Very sneaky. Ball moves all the time. The outfield around to the left for Paul Blair, who on the regular season hit 10 home runs. 
Ball two, strike two. Clemente is playing about 90 feet off the line. There you see the alignment in the infield and the outfield. Stargell to deep left. It is 340 down both lines here at Three River Stadium. 385 in the slots and 410 straight away. Ball off this synthetic turf really comes off quickly. Two balls, two strikes. And he just got a piece of it, and there you saw that ball running on him. And absolutely no win tonight. The flag hanging limp in center field. So the breeze is not a factor right now in this game. There you see old glory. Two balls, two strikes to Paul Blair. Batted 262 for the regular season and truly one of the great center fielders in baseball. Fouled away and there you saw him hit over the ball, bouncing and foul off to the left. Luke Walker, Kurt, got off a great line a couple of years ago before he went on to win 15 games. Somebody interviewed him and he said, tell my mother I'm alive and well, but not pitching in Pittsburgh. <laughs> then he went on to win 15 games. Ball two, strike two. And it's a base hit into the slot in left center. Oliver coming on and so Blair continues to bat a thousand in the series, his second hit in as many at-bats. He hit a curveball. Now the very fine shortstop of the Baltimore Orioles, Mark Belanger, batting 200 in the World Series. On the regular season, went for 266. No homers, 35 runs batted in. Been quite a juggling in the lineup with regard to batting order. Belanger was batting eight. Now up to the number two spot. Bounces off the right side. Cash a beautiful play, and he can't make it. Cash getting over to get to the ball. This has scored a base hit. <clears throat> Cash got to the ball. He was trying to shovel the ball from his glove to his shortstop. He's there. But as he got the ball out of his glove, it slipped away from him. That scored a base hit. Cash did a remarkable job getting to the ball to keep it from going through. So the Orioles have a quick threat already, top of the first inning. So at two on, here is Merv Rettmund batting at 231. One home run and four runs batted in in the series. You saw flashed there on the screen his average for the year. Ball. You'll see a lot of balls pop in and out of the mitt of many San Gian tonight as long as Walker is on. And there is early activity in the Pirate bullpen. Bruce Keeson. Eddie Vargo of Butler, Pennsylvania, does a lot of work. He's the plate umpire with the George Junior Republic, which is a school for wayward boys, and it's been a very worthwhile endeavor. Does that, of course, in the offseason. One ball, one strike to Rettman. A bunt foul. One and two, and they're trying for the base hit, obviously. You wonder how sharp these two will be tonight with their control. Walker pitched last September 22nd. Dobson started on September 24th. That's quite a layoff. Redmond being played very definitely to pull. Foul off the first base side. On this synthetic turf, as Walker retrieves the ball there, the balls roll very true. And normally, if you get a pretty good shot out over second or short, it'll go all the way to the wall. And the outfielders here run to surround the ball, not cut it off. The Orioles play on only one artificial surface in the infield in the American League. That's at Comiskey Park, Chicago. But they say they like this artificial surface. One ball, two strikes. Two on, nobody out. Top of the first and no score. Bouncer for the hole, and Hernandez flags it down, and he has no play, but he saves a run. From the whole side of shortstop, Hernandez getting it on into second. Wide range here by Hernandez, and this ball really takes off like a jackrabbit on his hard artificial service. 
throw too late at second base for the attempted force. And now the Orioles have the bases loaded, nobody out, and their cleanup batter, Frank Robinson, up. And Robinson batting at 583 in the series has two home runs, and both of his home runs have come with nobody aboard. But now, with the bases loaded, the Pirates will play the infield back. He's had seven base hits and 12 at bats. Outfield necessarily very deep in the round to the left. Ball. In his last six series games, three this year and three last, he's had 13 base hits for a five point. Last ball and a wild pitch, and run will score as the other runners move up. We'll await a ruling here. And the ball get away from Sanguin. The Orioles jump into the lead one to nothing. That's been scored a pass ball by the three official scorers, a low inside pitch that skipped off the mitt of Sanguin. It wasn't an easy chance, but the scorers figure that he should have handled it. Now they're going to put Robinson on with first base open. Well, this started out when Paul Blair hit what appeared to be a hanging curveball for a base hit. Then Belanger picked up the base hit off the second base side of the diamond when Cash attempting to shovel the ball along over to Hernandez covering there to get the out and did not. Now here's another tough man, Brooks Robinson, batting 500 in the series. hits and ten at bats. Base is loaded again. One run in and nobody out in the top of the first. One ball, no strike. High fly into shallow center. Oliver coming up. Tagging at third is Belanger. And he's going to try to come in under a strong throw. And he's in there. And everybody moves up a notch. So Robinson makes it 2-0 on a long fly to center. Belanger scores the second run. Give Brooks Robinson a run batted in. Move Rettman over to third after the catch and Robinson up to second base. And now the only left hand batter in the Baltimore lineup stands in and Boog Powell. He's been playing this series with a hand and a half. He's not cutting the way he normally does. He has some torn tissue in the back of his right hand that is plaguing his swing. Powell batting only at 083. Just inside the ball. Orioles leading here 2-0 in the top half of the first inning. A ball. The Pirates are not shifting as much, but now Hernandez has moved in a little bit behind second. He was over on the third base side of second. Now you see the shift there. With a count of two and oh, they've moved a little bit, figuring Powell have a better pitch to pull. That ball's hit very deep into center. Oliver going way back. And he's there, and that'll score another run. And now coming over to third on the play will be Frank Robinson. They make the throw, but he's in there. Wonder where he'd have hit that one with both hands healthy. They might have had to flag it down somewhere west of the Allegheny. And Bill Verdon is coming out. They didn't like that last blast by Powell. And they're going to get the young right-hander now, Bruce Keeson, in. Well, Bruce Keeson, as you'll recall, Kurt, had a very rocky time of it in game two. There's a break in the action here at Pittsburgh and the score. Baltimore, three. Pittsburgh, nothing here in the first inning.
And now a word on behalf of Major League Baseball. Kaysen, who is about six feet five, he says he weighs 185 pounds. There are those who doubt that. He pinched the final game in the, uh, or not the final game, but the big clinching game out there for a victory against the San Francisco Giants. When he came in in relief, pitched four and two thirds innings, allowing only two hits, striking out three. His first outing against Baltimore was indeed a very rough one. He, Walked a couple of batters at the wrong time for him and the Pirates. The bases were loaded at the time. He's 21 years of age, born and lives in Pasco, Washington. He was 10 and 1 for Charleston when the Pirates brought him up, and in the Major League season, six and five. Watch him throw there. The whiplash throw reminds you a little bit of Ewell Blackwell's delivery. It's about to say that sidearm stuff can be rough on right-handers. He goes to Dave Johnson, batting 2-5-0 in the series, and there's a bouncer to Hebner at third. On to Robertson, the inning is over. And so at the middle of the first inning, the score is Baltimore three, the Pirates coming to bat. Jumps on top, and now we'll set the Pirates defensively, for, or the Baltimore defensively. That's Merv Rettman in left field. Paul Blair in center. Frank Robinson in right field. At third base, Brooks Robinson. Shortstop, Mark Belanger. Dave Johnson at second base. Boog Powell at first base. Behind the plate, Andy Atchebaran. And on the mound is Pat Dobson, who won 20 and lost eight. Now, he, like Luke Walker, has not had a lot of work. And his last outing occurred on the 28th of September when he worked two innings in relief against Boston. His only relief appearance, by the way, of the year. He goes to Dave Cash, who's had two hits and 13 at bats. Batted 289 on the season. Dave is a thinking man's hitter. Outfield plays him shallow around the right. Bye, one and one. Dobson throws a fastball, a slider, a curveball, and his changeup is a palm ball. He has four different pitches. Ball one, strike one. Orioles lead 3 0 as Cash leads off for the Pirates in the first inning. Ball two. Patrick Edward Dobson, born in Buffalo, New York, now lives in Durham, North Carolina. His 12th professional season began in Detroit, by the way, in the organization there. Ball three. He, by the way, has allowed no runs in his last 11 innings. Three balls and a strike. He puts him on.
Archie Hebner. Batting 333 in the World Series has one homer and three runs batted in. Came in a losing cause. He can pull ax a ball and they play him way around to right. Ball. He was the first player here at the ballpark tonight. He arrived at five o'clock and took special batting practice. Unhappy that he didn't start yesterday, but Pagan, who replaced him, did a good job. One ball and no strikes. Now on your split screen, that's Cash at first base. High pop-up in the infield and shortstop Belanger settling under. One out. hero Roberto Clemente. He has hit safely in 10 World Series games and he took 11 years to get that string going. 10 and 19 uh, or 1960 went for seven games and three thus far here. Kurt. I think it's great that the fans uh, not only in this country around the world can watch his fellow play. Nobody plays the game harder in every department. Strike now as you see here with Boog Powell holding to cash and Johnson playing a little farther to his right Clemente has a big hole on his favorite side of the diamond right field. They just continue to pitch him outside and somehow or other he continues to hit it about a 340 clip. One and one. He always looks like he slept in a bad mattress or pillow. He's always cricking that neck around as if he has a bad neck. Matter of fact, he claims he sleeps with his eyes open. He just says he can't sleep. He can hear the slightest tick and he's wide awake. One ball, one strike. There's that palm ball. One and two. Willie Stargell on deck. Pirate dugout on the first base side. That's a walk-in dugout. One ball and two strikes. Cash leading off first with Boog Powell holding there. Orioles lead 3-0. One out here in the first. Now back. Took a little off that fastball that time, Kurt. It's pretty tough to fool Clemente on a change, by the way. And it was a high pitch. The Pirates were ninth in their league in receiving walks. They're a swinging team. They're not looking for walks. They come out of that dugout swinging, and the Baltimore pitching staff was the stingiest in the American League in giving up walks. Clemente, while he's played way around to right, can pull ax a ball up the left field side. If he, he gets his pitch, he can take it down that way in a hurry. One ball, two strikes. And watching carefully, as you saw, Clemente has a habit of just going right out over the plate with his body and watching it right into the catcher's mitt. Two balls, two strikes, one out and one on. The Orioles lead 3-0 in the bottom of the first. And that time he picks him up on a strikeout, and that's the second out of the inning. First strikeout of the game. Now Willie Stargell. Now we see Davey Johnson playing a deep second to him. He's back on the synthetic turf. The outfield around to the right. There you see the infield the way it is over shifted and Belanger's not quite behind second but he's way over. Ball. Stargell has hit quite a few home runs to the opposite field. There is no park that can hold him when he gets his pitch. Turned that one over, one and one. Somewhere along the line, Bob, our director Harry Coyle might get that third tier, that upper tier in right field where he's hit two of the longest shots in the still young history of this park. Mm -hmm. A ball and a strike to Stargell. 
There's a base hit to right center field. It may be in the gap. It is. It's going to go in there and cash his pass. He's on his way. Ball is bobbled in right field by Robinson, but I don't believe it would have made any difference. On the artificial surface, it scoots right through. Frank Robinson couldn't play the carom cleanly. And finally, it's the center fielder, Paul Blair, who picks it up and fires in. But Dave Cash is already into the dugout with a score. The Pirates are on the scoreboard, and Stargell's at second. And Al Oliver in there as we're back to live action. It's ball one to him. He's batting 100 in the series. Three to one now. Baltimore leading, and this could be a real big uh, scoring ball game. Al will be 25 years old tomorrow. One ball, one strike. Well, as you and I were talking earlier, Kurt, at the head of this uh, broadcast, anything hit on a line in between those outfielders, they don't run to cut it off. They run to just catch up to it. One ball, one strike. Ball two. Stargell, there's Robertson on deck. Stargell now seems to be getting back in the groove again. And if he is, it's going to be a big lift for the Pirates. There he is out at second base on a double. Fouled away. You know, Kurt, the Pirates all year long have been a great two out scoring ball club, and they uh, show some early signs here tonight. They normally get their runs in clusters. They hit a lot of back-to-back -back home runs. Two balls, two strikes. Ball three. The Orioles, with Dobson pitching, and perhaps, Kurt, it's because of the slow stuff, have swung their outfield around to the right. Most ball clubs in the National League do not play Oliver to pull this much. Now they're set over there about three or four strides to right center and right field. Fouled away. And look at Powell. He's almost on the first baseline. Mm -hmm. That's Stargell. He drove in the Pirates' run. Sizzling double to right center field. Three and two to Oliver. Foul back. He's hanging tough. Dobson is pitching him inside, though. The Orioles know that. That's why they're playing Oliver Moore as a pull hitter. There you see the manner in which Boog Powell is playing, and Johnson well over to his own left at second base. Two men are away. It's three to one. The Orioles have the lead. Foul ball. And that time, he hit it right off the end of the back. Just got the lacquer on it. Well, Oliver, you see two bills there. They all wear their protective cap on top, and then underneath, of course, their cloth cap. Pirates will keep that protective cap on their heads while always on the base paths. Ball three and strike two to Oliver. Stargell leading off second base. And a foul ball. doubt about this being the largest crowd and what a thrill it is to join Kurt Gowdy and NBC in sending you the first night game in World Series history from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania here on NBC. Three balls, two strikes. Step off the mound by Dobson. Dobson holds the baseball in his glove. We'll make his grip now. And it's a bloop. Get out in the shallow center field, and they'll not get it. And it's over the head of Blair. And Oliver will go to second, and it's three to two. Now here's a new trend in baseball, the artificial surface. Watch the bounce on this 
Texas leaguer that drops in. Normally on a grass outfield, that would just dunk there. But look at the high bounce, and Paul Blair, not used to playing on this surface, the ball bounced over his head, and that gives Oliver an extra base. It has scored a double. That's Earl Weaver, who's come on. The uh, Orioles now are getting their bullpen busy, and it's a 3-2 game. The Orioles came up with three in the top of the first. The Pirates have come right back with two. Dave Leonard is the right-hander, and Grant Jackson the left-hander. And of course, Kurt, the other advantage the Pirates had there, with two out, Stadio could run. With less than two out, he would have had to hold up on that one for fear the ball would be catchable. And that is part of the break of the game. And again, the Pirates are showing their two out run scoring ability as big Bob Robertson. And I suppose you know by now he missed the bunch sign yesterday and hit a three run homer. Into the dirt, ball one. He didn't miss one bunt sign, he missed two. Frank Oshiak, the third base coach, gave him two bunt signs, and he didn't read either one. He had a good excuse. He said, why would you ever ask me to bunt? I've never bunted in my life. And I was 0 for 9, and I had to get a hold of something. One ball, no strikes. Ball two. Well, if you pitch this fellow, there's Frank Oshiak. You pitch this Robertson away, he'll take you right out to right field. You get him in the wheelhouse, and the fans start to duck in left field. Two balls and no strikes. And he fouled it at the feet of Echebarren. You know, with those two runners on, Bob, when he hit the home run, Flamini knew there was something wrong, that Robertson missed the sign, and he, he was going to call timeout or ask for time. And Monty Urban of the baseball commissioner's offices here back in the 1950s, he was on base, got something in his eye, asked for time, just as the pitch was released, the umpire second, called timeout, and Whitey Lockman hit a home run that didn't count. And if Clemente had got the, the time and the pitch had been released, Robertson would have lost the homer yesterday. Two balls and a strike, and that is Oliver with a double out at second. He wheeled on that one, didn't he? Two and two. Pirates had that happen to them quite a long time ago. Frank Frisch was the manager. Pirates had a shortstop, Frankie Zack. He called time, and Ziggy Sears called it. Nobody heard him, and Jim Russell hit a home run. Then struck out. Two-two. Hit slowly off the first base side. Dobson to Boog Powell. But the Buckos come back with two runs on two hits and leave a runner. And at the end of one, the score, Baltimore three and the Pirates two. Left of your screen is Billy Hunter, born in Punxsutawney, Pennsylvania, known throughout the world as Groundhog City. A senior Baltimore coach, and he's in his eighth year. And on the right, George Stoller, born in Rutherford Heights, Pennsylvania, now lives in Harrisburg, the Commonwealth capital, managing the minors for 14 years. And I think that pitching coach George Bamberger must be looking in, Kirk. A longtime friend of yours and a great coach for the Baltimore Orioles. That's right. He uh, suffered a heart attack. He's in a Baltimore hospital, recovering nicely, they say, and watching the World Series game tonight. So the Orioles are in the World Series without their pitching coach, who helped develop that staff of four 20-game winners, the first staff in the majors to win, 
to have 420 game winners since the White Sox of 1921. And Kurt, in your game of the week coverage, uh, did not uh, Bamberger predict that Baltimore would have 420 game winners? He predicted it early in the season, in April. Right on the nose, he called it. Here's Andy Atchebaran in his first appearance in the World Series of 1971. Batted 270, nine homers, 29 runs batted in. The pitcher is Bruce Keeson in relief of Luke Walker. A ball. Walker's log in two thirds of an inning, three runs, three hits, no strikeouts, and one walk. This young man determines that he'll be married on the 17th of October, and he'd like to be late for his wedding. Bouncer down to catch. See how fast that ball got out there. On to Robertson, one out. Kurt was talking about it, I'm sure, over in Baltimore. Young Bruce Keeson and his bride-to-be announced their wedding plans as the 17th of October and found out about a week later that game seven, if it goes that far, will be in Baltimore. And uh, Buckos would like to make it go seven and let Keeson worry about the wedding later. This is Pat Dobson, batted 110 on the year. Ball right on the corner. Now, Keeson has a good riding fastball and a wicked sinker and a ball that runs in many times on right-hand batters. Strike two. Last year in the International League, he hit 28 batters. wonder how it feels to be 21 pitching in the first night game of World Series history. A ball. Well, I'll tell you one thing. I think he might have been nervous in Baltimore. That perhaps now has uh, disappeared. One ball, two strikes, one out. Baltimore leading 3-2 in the top of the second. Foul away. There was that sinking pitch. There's Danny Murtaugh from Chester, Pennsylvania. Banjo eyes, we call him. He won the World Series in 1960 with the Buckos, and here, 11 years later, trying for another. Always excited. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he really jumps around, doesn't he? One ball, two strikes. Good night. Keeson has his first strikeout. And there are two away in the Baltimore second inning. There is Earl Weaver. And you can't say too much about him, Kurt Gowdy, a magnificent manager with a fantastic managing record. He's taken the Orioles three years in a row to at least 100 wins and still hasn't won the Manager of the Year award in the American League. Paul Blair, who singled in the first inning and scored. Ball one to him. Had 10 home runs on the regular season. Fouled away. Paul Blair, not Brooks Robinson, was the leading hitter in the 1970 World Series with a 4.74 average. Time has been called, and that was called by Blair. Strike two. Look at that baby face, Kurt. 21 years of age. Two and two. He's even shaking off the signs tonight. You ask him if he weighs 185 pounds, and he'll challenge you. He looks like a stick, doesn't he? He said he built that body without lifting a weight. Ball two, strike two. Little bloop off the end of the bat might drop. It will. Watch Clemente now get tripped by it also. And uh, throw back into second, and Blair has his third hit in as many at bats in the World Series. Hit it right off the end of the bat and blooped it in there. And Clemente, that time, obviously was fooled. I think Clemente had ideas of making a diving shoestring uh, grab for this, and then at the last two or three feet, had to give up. The ball bounced over his head. That's the second one on the artificial turf. 
that has bounced over a charging outfielder and it's a double for Paul Blair. Been some peculiar base hits thus far. The Orioles have had uh, two infield singles and a bloop double. And the Pirates have uh, had a bloop double. Mark Belanger, who picked up an infield single in the first inning. Orioles lead three to two here in the second inning. Two out. No balls and a strike. Strike two. Boy, he's not only sneaky fast, Kurt, he is quick. Yes, and coming in from third base, his right-handers give on him. Melanger chokes on that bat about three or four inches. You can see the end of the bat handle hanging down there. Popped him up. Bobby Robertson at first wants it. And that'll stow the Orioles away. No run. One hit. No errors and one left. And we go now to the bottom of the second inning and the score. Baltimore three and the Pirates two. Frank Osiak at third, Johnstown, Pennsylvania, Don Leppert at first base. This telecast is presented by the authority of Major League Baseball and is intended solely for the private, non-commercial use of our audience. Any publication, retransmission, or other use of the pictures, descriptions, or accounts of this game without the express written consent of the commissioner of baseball is prohibited. That beep beep you hear in the background is for Manny Sanguin. He's known as the roadrunner here. Batting at 319 on the season. Jammed on the pitch down to Brooks Robinson. Boog Powell and one out. Striding in now in your picture is Jackie Hernandez. Obtained from Kansas City in an offseason trade with pitcher Bob Johnson, in which the Pirates sent Freddie Patek, Jerry May, and Bruce Dow Kenton there. Hernandez was not to have started tonight, but Gene Alley came up with an ailing knee. Strike. Baltimore leads 3-2, one out, none on in the bottom of the second inning. This broadcast coming to you. First night game in the history of the World Series and being seen all over the world here on NBC. In Taiwan, Canada, Puerto Rico, Venezuela, Colombia, Bermuda, Virgin Islands, Dominican Republic, Hawaii, Alaska, Mexico. And of course, our U.S. bases in Germany, Korea, Manila, and Panama. One ball, one strike. Fernandes had ideas of bunting down the third base when he's going against the best in the game at charging the bunt, and making that off-balance throw to first in Brooks Robinson. On the corner, a ball and two strikes. There you see the pirate bench, and that's uh, Billy Burden there, and I'm getting ready to bat, of course, Bruce Keeson. Two-two. We pause briefly for station identification. This is the NBC Television Network.
ball two strike two. Pull slowly to third foul. There's Brooks Robinson than whom there is no Homer a tremendous third baseman for the Baltimore Oil. He was a little irritated tonight. They had uh, some write ups in the Pittsburgh papers that Robinson wasn't going as well to his right as he did last year. A couple of shots were hit by him yesterday. He said those balls were by me. I didn't have a chance for them. I dived but they were gone. Yes they certainly were. Somebody apparently alluded to the fact he'd been on the banquet circuit a uh, little too much. Ball two strike two. And there's a drive toward left center and right at Paul Blair. Fans tonight are watching probably the best defensive center fielder in baseball Paul Blair who especially goes back as well. He's got a drop the ball. Here's Robertson is stopping at third. There's a jam up on the bases. Sanguian's hung up. Sanguian is out of second. Sanguian nearly passed Robertson on the bases. And he's tagged out by Mark Belanger. Or uh, Dave Johnson tagged him. All right, here it is again. And now you're going to see this thing we told you about, those lights peering over his left shoulder. And I'm sure that bothered Blair. And he drops the ball there. Now Blair's going to pick it up quickly. And Sanguin, who's a very daring base runner, is going to be called, caught out there by Belanger and tagged out by Johnson. And that is an extremely big out as Earl Weaver again has come back to the mound. Paul Blair, you saw something unusual when he gets to a ball and can't hold on to it. He's charged with an error. Blair's charged with an error, but he really made a recovery to get that ball back in the infield to the relay man, Belanger. Who sized up the situation and flipped to Dave Johnson, who tagged Sanguian. Sanguian twice now has been cut down between second and third. Bob Robertson wound up at third. Milt May now, a young left handed hitting catcher, is going to bat for Bruce Keeson. And on first is Davileo. The Orioles just made their eighth error in the series. Boy, the Pirates certainly have had all kinds of scoring opportunities, and it's not just this game tonight, Kurt. It's been every game they've been in. Milt May hit 278 this year, six homers, 25 runs batted in. He's only 21 years old, a brilliant prospect for the future for the Pirates. Ball one. He would be playing regular on most clubs. What are they going to do with him, Bob? Are they going to make Sanguian into an outfielder? They've been talking about it, but then they tried him in the winter ball. He ran into a fence and got hit with a line drive. They don't want to try that anymore. There's a drive in the right center. It's a base hit, and the Pirates take the lead. Coming in to score is Robertson. May singles to right center. Davileo goes to third. And the Pirates, for the first time, are in the lead in this game. Well, they finally got the timely hit. And now, Gene Alley goes in to run for Milt May at first base. May gets a big hand as he drops into the Pirate dugout. He came through. That move right there too, Kurt, will freeze Alley in the number nine spot in the batting order and allow Murtaugh to put his new pitcher, who will be Dave Justy, to come into the ball game and hit a little higher up in the order. Well, the two heroes right now, 21-year-old Bruce Keeson, who pitched a brilliant relief job tonight, and now Milt May, who's delivered the go-ahead single. Four to three, Pittsburgh. Two down, and Dave Cash up with runners on first and third. Eddie Watts low with it for a ball. At third is Davileo. 
Gene Alley at first. The Pirates have had 13 hits. The Orioles have had four hits. Ball two, two and nothing. The 2 0 pitch, a strike with a fastball, 2 and 1. He had to select a game, Kurt Gowdy, to send all over the world for the first night telecast in the history of the World Series. I don't know how you could select a better one. That's right. That everything. There's a drive into right field that Robinson moves back for. And that's all, but the Pirates took the lead in their lucky seven. They had one run, three hits, one error. And two left by Pittsburgh at the end of seven. It's Pittsburgh four, Baltimore three. We pause now for station identification. Justy now is on trying to protect the Pirate lead. The pitcher of record though for Pittsburgh is Bruce Keeson. And the 21 year old pitcher went six in the third innings in relief, allowed only one hit, no runs, didn't walk a man, struck out three, set a new World Series record by hitting three batters. He's the winner if the Pirates hold the lead. What about Dave Justy, Bob? Well, he was five and six on the year, but that doesn't really tell the story. He had 30 saves. He was the saving pitcher in the clincher for the Eastern Division title against the Cardinals. He was the saver in the clincher for the National League Championship. And against the San Francisco Giants, he appeared in all four games. Gene Alley has gone to shortstop for Pittsburgh, replacing Jackie Hernandez. Mark Belanger leading off as an infield hit in three times. A ball to him. We're in the eighth inning. That's Alley. Dusty has a fastball, breaking pitch, and a palm ball. Strike one and one. Throws that ball back out of the palm of his hand, uses that as his changeup. The Orioles have not had a hit in the last five innings. They had three runs and three hits in the first inning. They had a bloop double in the second inning, and they were stopped cold by Bruce Keeson. A 1 1 pitch. Just outside. 2 and 1. Dave Justy led the National League in saves this year with 30. He pitched one scoreless inning in the second game of this series. 30 years old. 2-1 delivery. 
Three and one to Belanger. Three one pitch to Belanger. Right in there to him. Three and two. Notice he's up on that bat handle a couple of inches. He's out. One away in the eighth. And there's the. We told you tonight would be the largest crowd in the history of Pittsburgh baseball, and it was. 51,378. Standing room only tonight here in Pittsburgh. And the lights on in the Golden Triangle for only the fourth time in the city's history, except for the Christmas celebration, in honor of the first World Series game at night. Ball one. The city of Pittsburgh downtown is a glow tonight. There'll be further a glow if the Pirates win this one. I'll go from a light on to a glow on. The 1-0 pitch. Last ball for a strike. One and one. Dave Justy attended Syracuse University where he's an outstanding athlete and was a phys ed major there. He met his wife Jenny at Syracuse University and she majored in psychology if that tells you anything. A 1 1 pitch. Ground ball drilled to Cash at second. Over to Bob Robertson. Two down. Frank Robinson. Been walked intentionally. Struck out and been hit by a pitch ball. 0 for 1. 4 to 3 Pittsburgh. Four runs, 13 hits for Pittsburgh. Three runs, four hits for Baltimore. The eighth inning, the Orioles have two down, nobody on. They're deep and way around toward left for Frank. A ball to him. Ball two. Bob Prince broke in with a great broadcaster in this town, a beloved figure, and it would be remiss if we didn't mention his name in a Pittsburgh World Series. Rosie Rosewell, we would call that pitch the old Dipsy Doodle. He surely would have. A pop up to the right side by Frank Robinson. Cash says, get out of my way. I got it. Three up and three down for Baltimore. And we're going to the last of the eighth inning as this Pittsburgh crowd goes wild with a score. Pittsburgh four, Baltimore three. Nineteen seventy one football highlights. There they are. We're doing the NFL during the regular season, the postseason, the Gator Bowl, Rose Bowl, Orange Bowl, and Senior Bowl, all on NBC. Richie Hebner up in the last of the eighth inning. And he is not hit. A ball to Hebner. Up the short, he singled in the third, he struck out, he lined out. Brooks Robinson making a great play on a low line drive in the sixth. One out of four for him. 
Flamini will follow. Foul back. Eddie Watt pitched the seventh and was stung for a run and three hits. Two balls and a strike to Hebner. There's a long drive and a deep ride backing up Robinson on the warning track right on the edge of it for the out. One down. Flamini has struck out single to right single to center and walk two for three. I swear he's going to twist that that neck off sometime Bob. Yes, and he's only started to do that in the last uh, month or so. Hey, Sue Salou, you'll recall, uh, has that. He has a nerve affliction, and Bobby uh, just does that. Well, you talked yesterday about his 12 pressure points. He's a real student of anatomy, and particularly his own. Four to three. <laughs> Pittsburgh ahead in the last of the eighth. The Pirates went ahead in the last of the seventh. One out, nobody on. A strike to Clemente. The Orioles got three runs in the first. The Pirates bounced back with two. The Pirates tied it in the third. And then went ahead in the seventh. Clemente played well over to right again. Powell guarding the first baseline, a bounding ball, a long throw here by Belanger off balance. And not in time, Clemente beats it out. That's his third hit of this game. <laughs> Thank you.